Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Also, just a quick note that submissions for the Zibby Awards are open and will close on September 15th. Go to zibbyowens.com and you will find the Zibby Awards open submissions where we celebrate all the under-celebrated parts of a book, like the best spine, the best author's note, the best table of contents. And authors can nominate their own best publicists, best editors, and so on. There will be an in-person award ceremony in October in New York. You will not want to miss it. Go to zibbyowens.com. Lewis Bayard is the author of Jackie and Me, a novel. He is the critically acclaimed best-selling author of nine historical novels, including Courting Mr. Lincoln and The Pale Blue Eye, which is being adapted into a Netflix film starring Christian Bale. Bayard's articles, reviews, and recaps have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Salon, and the Paris Review. Welcome, Lewis. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Jackie and Me and so much else. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure. I was very interested to see you over Zoom because I read your essay about your author photo and how uh, <laughs> everyone had been telling you you looked so young and handsome in the photo and you didn't really. And I was like, well, what does he really look like? <laughs> you look great. Um, you look just like the photo. Oh, well, I mean, thank you. I'm 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 a I'm a ever graying specimen. And uh, so I have to keep changing my author photos to to keep up with that. But the essay you're referring to was inspired by somebody who stopped me outside of the local coffee joint and said, wait, that, that's such a young looking picture of you on your cover. It's like, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm going to change this. Author picks are kind of the one piece of vanity that authors are allowed. So so it's the same glamorous lie that, you know, actors, an actor would do, do it with the headshots thing. We, we, get, we get one moment out of the year to be a little bit glamorous and a little bit fake. So <laughs> I, I have to say, I, well, I loved that essay and it's been funny because I've been meeting so many authors over the last few years. And sometimes there is such a huge divergence from the author, oh, yeah. photo, especially when I meet people in person. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. All right. You just don't know. No. You don't know. I know. I know. There was a, a very well-known British author. I will not name her, but she clearly hadn't changed her author photo in about 20 years because I saw a TV interview. It was like, oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> There was a little bit of a Doctor Who quality to her at that point. I, I think you're better off like with a less flattering author photo. Yes. And when you see people in real life, they're like, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't want people doing a double take when they look at you. It's like, wait. Yeah. No. Oh, that was your college picture? <laughs> exactly. Was that your yearbook? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> but here we are. And despite the essay, you look very true to life in, in the most positive. Thank you. Thank so, you anyway, very much. I was not one of these disconnects. So there we go. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Your book, Jackie and Me. Can you tell listeners a little about what it's about and how you arrived <laughs> at, at writing a book from the point of view of, of Lem and, and all of that? Like, where, where did this all come from? All that good stuff. Yeah, I'll just start yakking and cut me off when I'm going if I'm going too long. So Go ahead. Jackie and Me is basically a novel about Jackie before she was that Jackie. And by that Jackie, I could be talking about the the glamorous first lady in the pillbox hat. I could be talking about the grieving widow uh, with the beautiful children. I could be talking about the the wife of the Greek tycoon, uh, the enduring style icon, the paparazzi magnet familiar to generations of tabloid readers. The professional book editor, she, she had so many identities over the course of her life, so many avenues into this enduringly mysterious woman. But I chose as my avenue the Jackie before she was that Jackie. So when the, we first meet her in the course of the book, she is a year out of college and she is making a go of it as a career woman. She has a job for the Washington Times Herald. And her job title is Inquiring Camera Girl. So she, she goes out every day in the streets of Washington, D.C. 
And she's very dressed up. She's got the silk dress and the and the stockings and pearls and high heels. And then this heavy, really heavy Gravlax camera. And she buttonholes people on the street. These are man on the street interviews, in effect, and asks them some predetermined question, takes down their answers, takes her photograph, goes back to the office, edits the stuff down to 500 words, develops the pictures, and then does this six uh, days out of the week. So it's a real, it's not a Pulitzer Prize winning gig, but it's a real journalistic job. And it's in keeping with someone who said in her high school yearbook that her goal in life was, quote, not to be a housewife. So she's she's kind of serious about creating a career in journalism. But at the same time, she's a woman of her time and she's getting some pressure from her mother to find the right husband, because that's what a, a well-bred young woman in the early 1950s is supposed to do. And then she goes to a, uh, a dinner party uh, in Georgetown and meets this handsome young congressman, already famous, probably America's most famous bachelor at the time. And his name is, of course, is Jack Kennedy. And suddenly all her plans are kind of thrown for a loop. And she has to figure out if there's room in her life for this guy, what would it mean to be with this guy and that whole thing. And so she turns for for help to Jack's best friend, who is Lem Billings. And Lem is the narrator of the book. And he's really the reason that I wrote the book. Some years back, I saw an issue of my college alumni magazine. And there was this picture of two young 1930s undergraduates on the cover. I immediately recognized that one of them was this very young John F. Kennedy. But I, I was, my eye was drawn to the, the other guy who was larger and had this big grin on his face and this air of hilarity and bespectacled. And it's like, who is this guy? And I learned all, the, all about Lem Billings. He was Jack's best friend from high school through the end of life. He was a regular. He visited the White House every weekend, had his own room there. And was just his job in life. He had an actual career in advertising, but his job in his own mind and everybody else's was to be Jack's best friend. And so the novel is about what happens when that role conflicts with his new role as Jackie's friend. How how can he how can he serve both of those interests or both of those people, still be a friend to both of them when frankly their interests begin to collide? So in the book, and I didn't cross-check this or whatever, but was it true that Lem his father died and he was at Choate with Jack and that's how they became yes. friends. Okay. They became friends. Yes. So yeah, Lem's father died. So he was a scholarship student. One of the things that he and, and Jackie had in common was they both grew up amidst great wealth. And of course the Kennedys were enormously wealthy, but they didn't have a lot of personal wealth of their own. Jackie, for instance, lived with her mother and her stepfather, who was a standard oil heir, but she wasn't going to inherit any of that standard oil money. She was going, she was going to be sort of on her own. So they, they had that weird outlier a status in common, among other things, that that helped bind them together. Interesting, and I feel like part of it is also coming to terms with the person you're marrying and all of their foibles that you often know ahead of time, and like you decide to do it anyway. And then, are you allowed to complain? <laughs> <And it's> like, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yes, marrying Jack Kennedy came with lots of of baggage. First of all, the Kennedy family—you had to be kind of. Uh, go through the initi- initiation rite of meeting them in their hyena support birth and being hazed by the the, the Kennedy sisters. And then, uh, but then you had to be sort of prepared for a different sort of marriage. Jack Kennedy had no intention of being faithful to anybody he married. He had no real desire to be married in the first place. This whole marriage process was driven by his father, Joe Kennedy, because of political ambition. He just, he reasoned that nobody would vote for a presidential candidate. And he always imagined Jack as a presidential candidate who was not married. And it is interesting to think about that because even today, I think we have problems. We'd have problems with a a bachelor candidate or any kind of unmarried male or female candidate the national level is like, why aren't they married? What's what's going on with them? And it's it's significant and, too that- Unless we turned it into like the bachelorette meets the White House. <laughs> right. Which a would be also very fun. Re- yeah. I love it. I love it. That could yeah, be it's, sig- it's significant. The, the only bachelor president we've ever had is, is James Buchanan. And he, uh, of course, was rumored to be gay. So anyway- I also loved your piece on on the list of the likelihood of different presidents being gay and the yeah. signs of what is like likely and unlikely. That was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Buchanan is the, but far and away the most likely. And Lincoln is not too far behind. In fact, I, I wrote a whole book about Lincoln and his his dear friend, Joshua Speed. The nature of their relationship is still being discussed and debated among historians. But this is one of the first novels I'm aware of that really talks about what that would have looked like, what what that kind of love would have looked like in the context of 
Lincoln at the same time meeting Mary Todd and, and going through that whole courtship ritual with her. So it's a, it's a sort of love triangle of its own. And the same way that Jackie and me is a kind of triangle really with Lem and Jack and Jackie. So where did this fascination with political figures come from? Or I'm assuming you have a political, uh, some, or where did the idea for this to course through some of your books come from in case you're not actually fascinated? Well, it, that's a really good question because I don't know that I am necessarily okay. fascinated. Okay. I, I, well, but, but it's, but I think there must be some, something un, subconscious going on here because I live in Washington, DC. I came here to take a political job. I was a congressional press secretary for a few years, and then I worked for some nonprofit groups here. But I really came to realize that politics is not my love, uh, and and I haven't really done any political w- work for hire in, in many, many years. So I, I thought of myself as, as this, despite living in the nation's capital, as being, yeah, all right. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but then I, I then but then I look, I turn around, and as you say, I've written three books about presidents or future presidents, and it's like, where did that come from? I don't know. So maybe there's something subconscious going on there that I'm not aware of. I will say the next book, which I'm not at liberty to discuss yet, does not involve any presidents at all, okay. and in fact, it takes place in in uh, England. So it'll be a slight slight pivot anyway. Is it involving the monarchy in any way? <laughs> I can I'm not allowed to say Zibby, <laughs> don't push me. Don't press me, Zibby. Don't. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was your so where like before you came to DC and everything, did you always want to be a like when you were being the press secretary and everything? Like where did yeah. writing even come from? When did this come into Oh, I you know, i I think since high school really I kind of wanted to do that. I mean, I want to do other things as well, but they got sort of paired away. And that's what was left. Of course, I realized very early on that I couldn't make a living uh, writing fiction, not immediately. So, of course, in the usual manner, I got my day jobs and tried to smuggle some time out of my schedule, like an hour each day to write stuff. And then uh, starting in 1995, I became a freelance writer, kind of cobbled together a freelance writing career, writing for different organizations and just kind of finding jobs where I could, gigs. And and that kind of gave me a little more free time. And I just carved out an hour a day. It's sometimes an hour and a half, two hours. A great day was when I could get three hours, you know. And and that way I just kind of put together the first book, which found an agent, but not a publisher. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm done with this. this is very discouraging. Then I've, two months later, I'm writing another one, which didn't find an agent, but found a publisher. And so I've, I've gone about it... <laughs> Not the art orthodox way, you know. You're supposed to. You're not. You're. But it, it it wound up working out in the end. And now one of your one of your books is being made into a movie or a TV show or something. That is correct. It's a Netflix movie called The Pale Blue Eye. Uh, the original book is about, and the movie too is about, is a sort of gothic murder mystery set in West Point in 1830, featuring a young Edgar Allan Poe, who was actually a cadet at West Point in that at that time. And he joins forces with an older detective to solve a mystery involving cadets with their hearts carved out of their bodies. So it's very gothic and very Poe. The movie stars Christian Bale and uh, Harry Melling plays Poe. And then also Gillian Anderson's in it, Robert Duvall. It's really a wonderful cast. In fact, a lot of Brit- British actors in it. So it's it's. I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. I've seen bits and pieces, but it'll be out in December in the theaters for four weeks and then streaming thereafter. That's exciting. So. That's huge. It that's is exciting. Getting made and everything. I mean, that's a huge I know. Hurdle. Yeah, I know. Well, it's funny. This, this option business is interesting because a lot of times you 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 know how this works, but a lot of people don't may not realize that when when someone takes an option on your book, it doesn't really mean that much. It means they're going to take the book and try to make something happen. Ninety nine percent of the time, nothing does happen, mm-hmm. and it just so happened that the stars aligned for this one. I waste stars. I mean, the star Christian Bale. I think something fell out of his schedule. And he'd worked with this particular director two two times before, I think. So it just it just aligned, but most of the time it doesn't. So I feel I feel very fortunate. I interviewed Garth Stein, who wrote The Art of Racing in the Rain this morning. Do you do you remember that book? Anyway, it was the movie ended up being with like Mila Ventimiglia and Kevin Costner. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, he was like, it was optioned. 
And literally 10 years later, I got a call from a director being like, hey, I'm directing your movie. And he's like, no way. Yeah. Yeah. It was 15 years <laughs> for me really from the time it was first optioned to the time it actually happened. Oh so, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And whoever wrote The Queen's Gambit, Walter yeah. Davis, mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. dead like 30 years yeah. before, yeah. That, before that was, was like, poor Walter, he couldn't even enjoy that one. So yeah, um, yeah it's crazy. Okay. And, and I've always been advised by agents that are, don't spend any time imagining a movie because mm-hmm. I guess I said 99% of the time it won't happen, but this time it for some reason it did. So Interesting. grateful. Well, cool when it does. I'm yes, it is nice. When it does. <laughs> did you go on set or anything? Nothing. I went on set for one day. I was going to go back, but then they had a COVID lockdown. They, this, this was being filmed in right in the middle of sort of the COVID quarantine. So that was interesting. And, but I was also consulted on the script. They showed me successive drafts, which they didn't have to do contractually. Yeah. And they were very kind to kind of enlist my feedback. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's actually been, I don't have a single yet have a single Hollywood horror story, which is only problematic because nobody's going to buy you a beer to tell you that, it, oh, yeah. it's, it's been a lovely process. <laughs> I, I, I need, I need something with a little more, you know. Yeah. Try to rummage up something terrible in the next couple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's, see what, let's see what happens. Oh my goodness. And what about Jackie? Like, did you, have you ever met her? Like, did you actually see her in the East Village one day or anything or? No, I never did that. The first uh, the meeting you're referring to is how the book begins. Lem is telling the story from the perspective of 1980. So he's an old man now. And Jackie okay. has gone through her, all, all her stages of the, of the stations of the cross. And uh, he just runs into her by accident in the, in the East Village. That comes from a picture that was taken of her, an actual picture that's taken over the time. You know, there, there are all these Jackie sightings. And of course, she was being followed by paparazzi all the time. In fact, one guy, he just died. His name is Ron Galillo. And he was legally enjoined from getting anywhere within like 50 feet of her because he would just follow her everywhere. He'd take pictures of her kids on the thing. So she was just this enduringly fascinating figure. And so these, these interesting pic- snapshots come up every now and again. Did you read Stephen Raleigh's book, The Editor? I love that book. Yes. Stephen did a blurb for my book, which I appreciated. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, I love that. And I love Stephen. He's he's a very sweet guy. And that, of course, is about when, you know, when she was this professional book editor, so sort of, sort of her her career pivot. I think it started in the 70s, right? So mid, mid to late 70s. Yeah. Like that's continu- how it's, it's like the continuation. It's like if you can't get enough after this book, move on to that. Yes, book. exactly. Yeah. Oh, there's so many. There's so many <laughs> Jackie books, as we know. So the challenge really is just finding something that somebody hasn't kind of plumbed all the way down. And so I, I realized that a lot of people didn't know, you know, what Jackie did before she met Jack. She didn't know kind of what her life was like or what she was like. And, and one of the fun things about catching them at a young age is the same thing happens with Lincoln and courting Mr. Lincoln is they're not quite that person. So they're this liminal specimen and they're still finding themselves and they're surprising in some ways. I, I think people would be surprised to to know that Jackie's walking around the streets of DC, you know, grabbing strangers and asking them random questions. I, I don't think that comports with how we think of her. We think of her as being the pursued one, but not if not her as pursuing somebody else for the purposes of her job. But of course, as soon as she became engaged to Jack, she became the pursued. She became the object of the camera rather than the the operator of it. It's funny. It's almost like, you know how there's that whole line of stories of famous people when they were like little kids, like and how they grew up to, I can't remember, I'm not, Little, yeah, bit, just like, like Brad Meltzer's books, you know, the whole series. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should like brand this other swath of age, <laughs> like the young before adult. Before they were blank, yes, yeah, before they yeah. were blank, yes. But yeah. when they were close, you know. When they were close, exactly. <laughs> so you see the elements, they just haven't quite come to fruition. So the Jackie of my book, for instance, is still trying on yeah. different fashions, still trying on different looks. She has this poodle, then fashionable poodle cut which she's trying to figure, is is this how I really want to look? And is this how I, so she's, she's, she's still, you know, kind of like the girl in front of the teenage girl in front of the mirror, trying things on and seeing how they, seeing how they work, but also has, has a really practiced and innate eye. She uh, applied for this Vogue magazine scholarship, the Prix de Paris, which is very prestigious. She won. And one thing she said, she wanted to be art director of the 20th century, which sounds insanely ambitious, but in a way she sort of became that, right? We, she, yeah. she kind of created this, this sense of style that still lives today. I and mean, she's still a very classic this look to her. Yeah. Interesting. I love it. Okay. So aside from the ultra secret book that you're working on, <laughs> what else do you have going on these days? Like, what do you like to do when you're not writing and everything? 
Well, what, I, I'm always working. What are you talking about? Okay, I okay, never, okay, okay. I never stop. No, uh, let's see. Well, I teach a, a class at, G, at George Washington University, which, by the way, is where Jackie graduated from. That's where she got her her diploma from back in 1951. And I teach a, a fiction writing class. We just started up our, our semester today. And I, I do, I write kinds of other things. I write a lot of book reviews, um, some stories, some articles. And just this past summer, I had my first ever play mounted here in D.C. at the Washington Fringe Festival, which was great fun. And uh, I'm just trying to keep stories flowing. I'm talking to somebody about writing podcast dramas, uh, oh. possibly. Yeah, which I, I enjoy myself when I'm listening to podcasts. So anyway, so I'm, I'm always just trying to, to keep keep moving and keep telling stories. You know, I'm I'm 50. I'm going to be 59. And I sort of feel like my window, who knows how long the window will be. So I want to just keep telling stories as, as long as I can. That's so, that's, so depressing. That's a terrible way to look at it. Oh no. I think it, I think it's great because it imparts urgency to it. Okay. It's like, I gotta, I gotta keep, I gotta keep telling stories while I can. That's, that's my feeling. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. I do. I do always have this like ticking time clock in my head, this racing. Yeah. Clock. I do feel I that. I think it's right? important. I think it's important. I mean, I know writers who don't have that ticking and and it takes them a long time to push stuff out. You know, I have a friend who's been working on a memoir for something like six years now. It's like, okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm 46. <laughs> Mine already came out. I'm done. I'm like, right on for the next. <laughs> no time to spare. You never know. What's right. Going. Right. Yeah. What do you, what's next? Let's go, Come on. Let's go. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got this. This is see. This is a nice time to way to fill your fill your days. You've got your meeting meeting people like this, and it's very cool. And introducing people to to new authors, new books. That's awesome. I have also a publishing company, publishing my own books. Uh-huh. There you go. Really fun. Yeah. Yeah. See, and 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 you're, so you're your own editor. You're a, your own everything. Your own. Well, no, my books go from somewhere else. I can't edit my own books. I'm, that's it's like a yeah. different. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah. But yes, I love doing this. It's amazing. I learn so much every day. It's like a perpetual class. I was literally, you're talking yeah. about your students. I'm like, oh, wouldn't that be fun to like go back to class <laughs> instead of like all the emails I've been getting today from all the teachers of my various kids? And I'm like, oh my gosh. But like to be a student again, I love being a student. But anyway. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. There, I see some classes on the curriculum. It's like, oh, I want to, I want to take that Virginia Woolf class, or I want to, you know, yeah. it, it, it would be fun. I, I, I don't know that I want to write essays again. I think I think I remember being glad I didn't have to write any more essays, but I I do write book a lot of book reviews, which is sort yeah. of similar. But I don't, I, I don't think I'm I don't mind essays. I'd prefer yeah. not to do like rote memorization. I can't remember anything anymore. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. Especially as one gets older, that becomes yeah. a little yeah. yeah yeah. I can barely find words, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on Mom's No Time. Thank you. This so- has been great fun. Okay. I've really enjoyed meeting you. You too. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 